any statement whatsoever about the world or about reality that is not based on such information. It therefore follows that the concept of a reality without at least the ability in principle to make statements about it, to obtain information about its features, is devoid of any possibility of confirmation or proof. This implies that the distinction between information, that is knowledge, and reality is devoid of any meaning. <coughs> And then uh, another quote from uh, Andre Linder, who's a professor of physics at Stanford University. Uh, he says the following. Uh, the current scientific model of the material world obeying laws of physics has been so successful that we forget about our starting point as conscious observers and conclude that matter is the only reality and that perceptions are only helpful for describing it. But in fact we are substituting the reality of our experience of the universe with a conceptually contrived belief of an independently existing material world. Is it possible that consciousness, like time-space, has its own intrinsic degrees of freedom and that neglecting these will lead to a description of the universe that is fundamentally incomplete? What if our perceptions are as real, or maybe in a certain sense even more real, than material objects? The standard assumption is that consciousness, like time-space before the invention of general relativity, plays a secondary subservient role, just being a function of matter and a tool for the description of a truly existing material world. But let us remember that our knowledge of the world begins not with matter, but with perceptions. And then last quote from uh, Donald Hoffman, who's a cognitive scientist in uh, uh, University of California. He says the following. A con as a conscious realist, I am postulating conscious experiences as ontological primitives, the most basic ingredients of the world. I'm claiming that experiences are the real coin of the realm. The experience of everyday life, my real feeling of a headache, my real taste of chocolate, that really is the ultimate nature of reality. I believe that consciousness and its contents are all that exists. Space-time, matter and fields never were the fundamental denizens of the universe, but have always been, from their very beginning, among the humbler contents of consciousness, dependent on it for their very being. So while neuroscientists struggle to understand how there can be such a thing as first-person reality, quantum physicists have to grapple with the mystery of how there can be anything but a first-person reality. So in this section here that we're now currently looking at, um, we saw there that we are stuck here in this cycle of existence called samsara because of our distorted view of reality. That by grasping onto an independent me and an independent objective world, that leads to attachment to pleasant things because they seem to be the source of our happiness. It leads to aversion to unpleasant things because they seem to be the source of our suffering. And all of our mental afflictions are coming out of that it's driving our behaviour and resulting in our current experiences and all of our suffering. But what we saw was that this grasping to independent me is a distorted view of reality. There is no independent me here. That if we really investigate, we'll come to see that things do not exist independently because... They are dependent arisings. They exist dependently. They come into existence dependently. And we saw that yesterday that things come into existence dependently in terms of causes and conditions, parts and labelling. And remember that labelling is really all about drawing these lines, creating an object, meaning that the things we perceive exist within our conceptual framework, that every object we perceive we are creating that with our conceptual mind. So therefore we have these terms that things are merely labelled. Uh, things are not findable in the basis. But of course that does not mean that we are simply hallucinating everything. We're making everything up. 
that this view of emptiness is not saying nothing really exists. In fact, emptiness and functioning world are two sides of a coin. That this is really the correct understanding of emptiness. That because things are empty, i.e. things are not existing independently, they do not exist from their own side, therefore things can function. And because things function, they must be empty of independent existence. That's the correct view of emptiness. And we saw there that this coming to this middle way understanding, correct understanding, is very difficult because we are stuck in these two extremes. The extreme of existence and non-existence. So for us now, there there seems to be two options. Either there is this real independent me and independent world that seems to be here, or there can be no me and no world, because we don't see any other possibility. Either things are as they appear, or they don't exist. And so what happens is, of course, is when we investigate this supposed independent me and independent world that seems to be here... And we come to really see, well, actually, there is no independent me here. There's no independent world there. Then what often happens, of course, is then we conclude wrongly that, oh, therefore there's no me and no world. And we fall to the other extreme of nihilism. And so to help us to overcome that extreme of nihilism, of course, is to understand that even though we can't find the me, can't find things there... That doesn't mean there's no me and no world. Because that really means there is a dependent me, a dependent world. And so to help us to overcome that extreme of nihilism is to understand there is a me, there's a me here, there's a world there, existing and depending on causes and conditions, parts and labelling. That is the me and the world that does exist. And if we understand that, then we can find this middle way between those two extremes. And as we saw there yesterday here in the text, it's very much recommended to begin our investigation by investigating me, the person. Because that's where we start to go wrong. We grasp onto this me and see ourselves as independent of what we experience. Because remember with yesterday, we said, we said that in experience, there's two aspects. There's the experiencer and the experienced. And we need to correctly distinguish those two aspects, otherwise no meaning. But what we do, of course, as soon as we distinguish experiencer and experienced, then we grasp onto the experiencer and split ourselves off from the experience and see ourselves as independent of what we experience. And then everything goes wrong from there, of course. Um, So therefore, if we can really start that investigation here to see there is no independent me here, there's no me independent of what we experience, then we can realise nothing exists independently. And so we we start with the person, and that's where we left off on page nine. Uh, Yeah, just let me finish this and then a question. Um, So in page 9, towards the bottom there, the last part we did where it said, without wavering, and this is what we are to do, investigating the me, the person, it said, without wavering in the slightest from the earlier state of meditative equipoise, single-pointedly equipoised in the concentration of shamatha, meaning to have an effective basis for vipassana, we need shamatha. Because if our mind is distracted, it's dull, it's drowsy, we won't be able to investigate very well. We'll get confused, we'll get distracted, we, we, won't, we won't work. But then if we have a more calm, clear, focused mind, then it says, just as, for example, a small fish darts through a lake filled with clear water without disturbing the water, likewise use a subtle awareness to intelligently investigate the nature of the person, the I, who's the meditator. That is, investigate the way in which the person appears to the mind, the way in which the person is apprehended by the mind, and the way in which the person actually exists. So if we do that, and that's what we did just now and and yesterday as well, we look and we see, well, there's a me here. It appears to exist completely from its own side, and we accept that appearance. We apprehend it in that way. But if we investigate 
How does it actually exist? And then the next paragraph says, when investigated in this way, the way in which things actually exist is that all phenomena, the being, the I, the person, and so forth, are a mere name, merely imputed by conception and merely labelled like snake onto a striped rope or human onto a can or pile of wood. So by coming to see that these, the me is not findable, we'll come to realise that me is merely labelled. And the analogy here is the snake onto a striped rope. Um, so this analogy is given very often in the context of emptiness practice. And the analogy is that uh, imagine you're walking along a path and it's quite dark, and just beside the path there's something coiled up. And then when we look we go, oh, snake, and then we run away. But then we come back with a, a, a light, shine the light on it and go, well, there's no snake there. So similarly, now there appears to be a me here and a world there, and then we, of course, we react. If it's pleasant, attachment, or in the case of the snake, we're mistaking the rope for a snake, we, we have aversion, fear, anxiety for something unpleasant. But if we shine the light of wisdom, of emptiness, we'll see that nowhere is there any the cup to be found, the me to be found. So just like there is no snake to be found in that coil. Similarly, there's no person to be found here in that basis of the body and the mind. Similarly, there's no cup to be found in that basis of collection of many things there. So this uh, will help us then to release that grasping and to really realise that everything uh, is a dependent arising, existing only within conceptual framework. Question? Um, so I'm trying to connect the practice of shamatha and the content of what you just said. So the process of thinking about who is the me that's meditating at the level of being aware of your awareness, how is that meditation happening? Assuming that at that lower level of subconscious, there's not much use of language during the meditation. Like I'm not, I won't be asking myself, where is me, where I'm like in a very subtle mind. And that leads me to another question, which is, where does the border or the, the, the limit between coarse mind, subtle mind, very subtle mind, that's a label too. So what's the... Yeah. So of course at our level, we're not a chamata. Um, in fact, we're nowhere near there. And so if our mind is very distracted, not focused, drowsy, uh, there's not really much point in doing Vipassana practice. That would be like a, an, a scientist running experiments on equipment that they know is completely faulty. I mean, no point. You run it 100 times, you get 100 different results. So you have to make the equipment functional, at least reasonably functional. And that's what shamatha practice is all about. So we have to get that threshold down a little bit, you know, to make the mind much more calm, clear and focused. And of course here, in this part of the text, we're talking about starting with person. But of course actually in actual Mahamudra we wouldn't start there. So that's why uh, before we introduced the shamatha practice of resting in awareness, or you could ease also equally well do the practice of observing the mind, the thoughts and emotions, as a basis for the Vipassana practice of investigating the mind. So here, um, if you are doing the Vipassana practice of looking for the person, then, of course, any shamatha practice is a good basis for that. But because the, in Mahamudra, the Vipassana practice is uh, investigating the mind, then it's much more better, it's better to start with the shamatha practice of observing the mind as well. I mean, you could use the breath, but it would be more helpful because it's, you're focusing on the same thing in shamatha vipassana. Here, when we're doing the, this practice we just did of the person, um, then as a basis in shamatha, we can use more or less every object because we're not using person as an object for shamatha. So then you could use the breath, you could use the mind, you could use a mental image, you could use whatever you want in that case. Was that the first question? Um, yes, but still, in, in what you just described, I can imagine it's on the course level, course mind level. Right. Um, my question is, 
if we're going into the deeper su subconscious mind, how... Well, it's not subconscious, it's conscious. <laughs> so we conscious can't... I mean, it's subconscious for us now, but if we practice in shamatha, it'll be conscious mind. It's not subconscious anymore. So, I'm assuming that type of meditation so if we achieve shamatha, there's no such thing as subconscious mind. We've gone beyond that because the threshold has gone right to the bottom. And then will you be practicing meditation with the, the questions just as you guided us now? Like, where is the person? I'm you would you questions. would be going into the meditation primed with that question. And then in the meditation, you just look. You look directly. Because remember, even here, it said that we need to be like a, a small fish. We need to use a subtle awareness. Even at our level now, if we don't use a subtle awareness, if we use a lot of conceptual discursive thinking, that's going to disturb the mind. So even at our level, it's recommended to do that in a very subtle way. Don't have that. And of course, what we don't want to do is turn it into an intellectual exercise. And this is where very often people go astray. Particularly this practice of, uh, well, both the Vipassana practice looking for the mind and for the person. When we're looking for the person, then often uh, the intellectual will come on and say, oh, hang on, what are you doing? I know the answer. I know the answer. And the answer will be based on some belief system that we have. You know, if we've, if we've studied some Buddhism, and we've heard that it's the subtle mental continuum that goes from life to life, the intellectual mind will come up and go, I'm the subtle mental continuum. <laughs> you don't need to search, I know the answer. <laughs> or if we've had a maybe Christian background, I'm the soul. I don't need to search, I know I'm the soul, that's the real me. Or if we've studied more new age philosophy, uh, intellectual mind will probably go, I'm subtle energy, I'm subtle vibration, because everything in the universe is subtle energy vibration, so I'm that. But then we're not doing the practice. We're not doing the practice. So we need to leave the intellectual, the intellectual mind out of the equation and just look and see what we see. That's important in this practice. Mm -hmm. uh, is the uh, practice of defocusing, like, of? like not focusing, but when I start to, to focus my mind, Immediately, this defocusing, and no, nothing is there. Not, I, I, I can't look for the eye because there's nothing there. There's a like this quietness. So right. there's not only not me. There's nothing. Mm. I'm like uh, floating. Right. Not floating because this is new age. But yeah, and, and this is still to come in the text. It's coming in the next page. So <laughs> the brief answer, and then we'll discuss that more shortly. <coughs> is that now the focus is there seems to be a me here. Me. And then we look and we go, oh, can't find. And then... And that's experience of emptiness. Um, and it comes more in the text, so maybe we'll leave till then. As the next part of the text, it talks more about that experience. I'd like to see if I understand your saying about emptiness and a functioning world being the same coin. Well, it's two sides of a coin. Two They're not identical because yeah. one side of the coin is not the same, but you can't have one side of the coin and another side separately. They're, they're two, it's two, part, two aspects of the same thing, yeah. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll give an example and I'll, it's, it'll be a negative example. I'll negate it. Uh, if I am totally independent of everything, mm -hmm. And my nice neighbor here is totally independent of anything, of everything as well. Then I will never have any kind of effect on him, actually. Correct. So that's well. That's one implication. Okay. Because if you're independent, I mean that's why often. So then the world doesn't function because it can't. Has... I mean it can't because then you're not dependent on anything and you don't depend on it. I mean it, it, the same thing is like, you know, people often talk about free will. And people often have, I mean, of course, you can understand free will in many different ways, but one common way is I'm an independent thinker. Mm -hmm. I can do whatever I want. I'm independent. I mean, this idea of free will is just completely irrational. I mean, it's okay. illogical. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. No? Thank you. I have a question about uh, the meditation. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. <coughs> okay. I mean, I'm going to explain the steps in it now, but maybe that will lead into my explanation. Great. Um, so, so checking the body seems like understandable because, like, I understand the feelings in my body. But then searching in the mind, when there's a whole meditation about where is the mind, it's very puzzling and I just lose myself, like, mm -hmm. what am I looking for? Am I looking at what? Am I asking where it's... Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, lose, I lose the sense of me just by being puzzled. Mm -hmm. Right, so maybe we'll go on to the next part and then that will hopefully be addressed there. So let's go to the next part of the text at the bottom of page 9. There's a quote here. Um, from Nagarjuna, again, who's the founder of this Majamika philosophical system in the second century, which is the basically um, coming from the teachings of emptiness in the perfection of wisdom teaching. So generally, uh, the view of emptiness that we're following is, is really based on here, Nagarjuna's understanding. And he says, the person is not earth, not water, not fire, not wind, not space, not consciousness. Nor is the person all of these together. Yet apart from them, what person is there? So historically, of course, the material world was often divided up into these elements, the earth, water, fire, wind, space elements. Um, so if we want to simplify this uh, with respect to the person, the earth, water, fire, wind and space elements, you could sort of subsume as body. So if you wanted to uh, have a condensed version of this text, of this verse here, it would be the person is not the body, the person is not the mind, meaning not consciousness, nor is the person, the body and the mind together, yet apart from the body and the mind, what person is there? So that's sort of the condensed understanding of that. And that is actually the uh, one of the most common approaches to this practice, because when we do this searching for me, the, the meditator, the, the, the person, um, we can approach that many ways. But one of the classic ways of approaching it um, is what we did in that meditation and what's described here in that verse, and that's presented with a presentation called the four essential points. And the first point is the most important and where we often go astray. And this was mentioned yesterday in the text, this idea that we have to clearly identify the object of negation. And remember, what this means is we need to have a clear picture of how we see ourselves existing now. Because that's what we're going to search for. And if we don't have a clear picture of how we seem to exist now, then we can do the search and we won't come up with any answers. Again, using the analogy from yesterday, this would be like there's a crowded room of people and we're looking for a particular person in the room but we don't have a clear picture of what that person looks like. We could look all day and never come up with an answer. Well, maybe that's them, I'm not sure, I don't know. But if we have a clear picture of what that person looks like, then we just look and we go, ah, there they are, or nope, not in the room. And then we can come to a definite answer. Yes, they're there, no, they're not in the room. So if we don't do that well, then the rest won't work. And this is often where um, people go astray. This is the most important point. And again, if we don't have uh, some level of shamatha, if we don't have a more calm, clear mind, then when we try to get this picture, it won't be very clear. So that would be like... Not having some level of shamatha would be like someone gives us a picture of the person in the room, but with our eyesight's poor, and we go, and then we look in the room, we go, oh, I'm not sure. So practicing shamatha would be like seeing that clear picture and then seeing clearly the room. So therefore, that's why we see in the text here, shamatha is the basis of vipassana. Without some shamatha, we can do this vipassana practice all day long, 
and get very confused and, and what am I, where am I looking, what am I looking at, I, I'm not sure, I, I'm just confused. Um, so therefore we need to keep working on the shamatha. Do we actually have to achieve shamatha before we begin Vipassana? No. In fact, we'd be waiting a long time before that. But if our attention skills are very poor, if we're completely <coughs> distracted or very drowsy, then I would suggest there's not much point in putting a lot of effort into Vipassana practice. That would be like looking in a room with almost having no sight at all. I mean, at least improve that. And then we can maybe get, well, yeah, maybe that's the person or not. So this is the most important point. Um, so we need to get a clear picture. And that's what we did in the meditation just now, is that... Particularly when we, as a beginner, when we sit down to meditate and we relax the body, we relax the mind, then often a, the strong sense of me sort of drops away a little bit. And then because our attention skills are not very good and then we're, we're looking, but we don't really see sense of me because we're not... But if that's why as a beginner it sometimes says, uh, think of a situation where you have a strong sense of me. And that's what we did in the meditation. We said... Think of a situation where someone's praising you for something wonderful you did. So usually when that happens, there's a very strong sense of me. I'm being praised. Or you could use the example, someone's criticising you for something you never did. Then there's a very strong sense of me, the me's being criticised. So as a beginner, uh, if we can't really get a clear picture, then think of some hypothetical situation and then just rest in that experience of the me being praised, the me that's being criticised. That's the me we need to look for, because that's the me we're identifying with. That's the first step. Question. So in relation to this, to this point, uh, in the practice of looking for the praised me, I was looking and I felt some kind of warm feeling that was like a cat being uh, pampered. Uh, so it's a feeling. It's not something intellectual. I was feeling right. So this, I have to look for a feeling, or I have to look for the intellectual. You have to look for the me who has that feeling. You said you had a feeling. Yeah, so because you had a feeling, it's not you. Yeah, but when I, I, I'm, I'm looking at the first step. Yeah, but we haven't. Step, yeah, but we, we haven't started looking yet. So you're down here. So let me go down here, and then we can look at that. Okay? okay so because you know, at the beginning of the meditation, I have a question on what I should identify. With right. So and, and okay, 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 start okay, right okay. So place. when you're getting praised, you have a sense I'm being praised. Yeah. Don't you? I have. What? I have more of a, of a feeling. No, no, but but I mean, you 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 have you have. Uh, you have an experience of me being praised. Yeah. Me. No? Now, what we need to be clear, careful about here is that whenever we have these, a sense of me, particularly if it's a strong impetus like praise or criticism, then often together with that comes a lot of effect in the yeah. body. Right. But that's the effect in the body. That's not me. The criticism of me has a side effect of tension in the chest, yeah. in the stomach, but that's not me, that's a side effect. So what do we look for? Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I totally understand. Yeah, but you I have... Know, I, I can have intellectual, but I have to know what to look for. And that's why we have to... Pray. That's why here um, we have to just rest in that experience of me. So what we, what we need to be careful of here is we're not looking yet. So there's no looking here. If you're looking, you, you're, not, you're already down here. So we're not trying to look. But it's intellectual. It's no, no, it's ex completely, completely experiential. Like, example, the, the, the person in the room, if I give you a picture and say, here's the person to look for, is that intellectual? No. You just look, don't you? You go and you study, you look. And you become very familiar with that. You don't go, you don't think about it, you don't intellectualize, you just look. That's all we're doing here, we're looking. We're just looking, me. We're not trying to look, where is the me? 
We just rest in the in the experience of me. 